when you tell someone that they can turn to the Bible and that they can actually trust it, that they can actually see and read and understand God's will, God's words, um, for many, it's almost too hard to believe. Many scholars are saying, well, the Bible's not trustworthy, it's not historical, it's mythological, folk stories, and so on. Skepticism is so rampant, it's so pervasive today. And much of that criticism comes from the findings of archaeology, where it seemed that the findings of archaeology did not agree with the Bible. I'm a pastor in addition to directing the Associates for Biblical Research, and in that role I see the powerful forces that are at work culturally in the lives of people. And so, so many times we have to explain, explain why you can trust the Bible. And of course, as soon as they begin that kind of consideration that I can trust the Bible, they want to know why they should believe the stuff that's in the Bible. How do we know that's true? We are trained archaeologists doing original research and original field work, and that is uh, unique uh, in Christianity. We're not just drawing on the research of others, while that's certainly important. It's going out into the field, digging in the ground, and finding artifacts and pottery, and being in a place where the events of the Bible actually took place. We are the uh, archaeological uh, voice, if you will, for evangelical Christianity and doing the research and evaluating claims and uh, just uh, substantiating the truth of God's Word. We're correcting a lot of uh, ideas that are out there uh, that kind of float to the surface. You know, we've all heard of the Da Vinci Code stuff and we've heard of the, the Gnostic Gospels, like the, the Gospel of Thomas or the, uh, the Gospel of Judas. We get many questions coming in that people have about things they read in the Bible or things they hear uh, on the news or read in the newspaper or something. And they'll, they'll come asking questions, is this really true? So we're able to provide help and information and edifying material to build up the body of Christ and strengthen the faith of His people and to provide answers for those criticisms which are leveled against the Bible. So we serve a very important function to demonstrate the truth of Scripture through our research and to demonstrate that the critics are wrong when they say there was no evidence found at Jericho or uh, for I. We are finding that evidence. Over and over and over again we find in the archaeological record discoveries, cities, places, inscriptions that affirm the things that are recorded in the Bible. We want them to understand the cultural context. We want to under, them to understand that Jesus actually lived, that his uh, disciples actually lived. Or if we go back into the Old Testament, we want them to understand that God in, really did create the heavens and the earth, that God uh, it truly did um, cause Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, that it was a real historical event. So the work of ABR is so much more than doing archaeology, although that is our area of expertise. Um, it's so much more than just simply uh, answering questions. We are truly seeking to give, uh, give young people, but give, give people of all ages, an understanding that indeed the, the content of the Bible can be trusted. And it's not just an intellectual thing, it's not a, just a historical thing, it comes down to God's interest in transforming the lives of people either bringing them into the kingdom or when they're in the kingdom, growing them in their faith in the Son of God. For them to be able to apply their trust in the Word of God in their lives, in their marriage, in their families, in their work relationships, in their ability to share the gospel with someone that they work with or a family member. Uh, it's incredibly practical. Uh, it's not just an intellectual pursuit. And if it were an, just an intellectual pursuit and didn't change lives, it wouldn't be faithful to what God has called us to do. When I learned about the Associates for Biblical Research, I was really interested, captivated by what they did. So captivated, I left my job and my ministry and joined the ABR staff and have now been involved with the Associates for Biblical Research for almost 20 years. 
I, I find a lot of great excitement in being able to not only make the intellectual arguments and do the intellectual work, but to see people actually change by the power of the words that God has given because they're alive and they change and transform lives um, for eternity. The Bible has changed my life and God has really used archeology span to help me really understand and appreciate the Bible better. Ultimately, we're looking to help lead people to a relationship with God. The thing that really proves the Bible is God's Word is the impact it has in our own lives. The Bible's changed me. That's the real proof. ABR is all about helping people come to know God by seeing and believing that what God has said is true. Well, good morning. Blessed Lord's Day to you. A little humid and rainy, but uh, another wonderful day to be here together with God's people to worship Him and to uh, study the Scriptures. Um, it, it's, uh, it's just a privilege to be here. I'm, I'm very grateful for Steve's invitation, Pastor Steve and his family. We got a chance to spend time with them last night and uh, stayed over at their house. My wife and daughter will be coming for the, for the second service. They slept in a little bit this morning. But, um, you know, I, as, I was, uh, as I was listening to the worship team sing, I was thinking about the different gifts that God gives people. And um, <laughs> it was, I thought it was rather humorous. I thought about a half a dozen times, I hope that my mic is not on while I'm singing. I hope that my mic is not on. They sound so wonderful and I sound so terrible singing. <laughs> Praise the Lord it wasn't on. Uh, but it really, really wonderful. Thank you to the worship team. I, I really, really enjoyed uh, worshiping the Lord here. And uh, it just reminds me of the different gifts that God has dispensed to each one of us, the different callings that we have, um, and appreciating, appreciating those gifts. Uh, the call on my life uh, is, it has to do with uh, a defense of the gospel, uh, defense of the Christian faith, what we call broadly uh, apologetics. Um, and as you saw from the video, which I think introduces our ministry in a much better way than I can do it, um, the value of archaeology and how it helps equip the church to uh, not only be edified in their walk with Christ and understanding that they can trust what God has revealed in His revelation of the Scriptures, uh, but also as a tool that we can use to uh, engage with people about the truth of the Bible. There's a lot of skepticism out there, as you know, and you never know where a person may be at in terms of what they understand about the gospel. And so sometimes archaeology can be a tool that you can use to discuss the gospel with someone, the reliability of the Bible. People have a lot of questions. And so that's one of the goals of our ministry is to equip uh, God's people uh, in this kind of work. So today I'm here to share with you a little bit about the work that we're doing in Israel uh, before I do that, I just want to share a couple of, of things about the ministry. You saw the, the video, of course. We have just a variety of outreaches that are available to God's people, most of which are free. Uh, we have a website, BibleArchaeology.org. We actually have a television program, which I'll tell you about at the end, and our magazine and newsletter, um, different items that people can access and use to find out more about how, how do I use archaeology uh, how does it edify me, and how can, it, can I use that information or point people to it so if they have questions about the history of the Bible and about its accuracy, you have a place to send them. Uh, I certainly understand uh, in the 13 years I've been with the ministry that this is, there's different levels of interest in the church. For some here, uh, we've gone out to churches and they, they come up to me and they say, I want to go to Israel and dig with you. And others will say, well, that's pretty interesting. I'm not sure what to make of all that. And everywhere in between. Uh, so I'm very cognizant of the different levels of interest, but whatever it may be, I hope that uh, our ministry will help you in some way. And if, if uh, history is not your thing or archaeology is not your thing, at least you can point someone in that direction if you ever get a question or you see on television 
uh, a lot of misinformation about the Bible on different programs, you'll remember, hopefully, the work that we're doing. And so uh, I'm here to talk to you this morning a little bit about our dig at Shiloh. Now, in the past, our, min- our ministry has been around, we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary next year, and we've already done two archaeological excavations in Israel related to Joshua chapter 7 and 8, the city of Ai, or Ai. You may recall from the account that the Israelites go into the land, they conquer Jericho, you know, the famous story, the walls come tumbling down, and then they go and they fight a battle against the king of Ai in Joshua 7 and 8. And we excavated a site for 20 years which we identified as the city of Ai, we believe, is the correct location for that. And those excavations ended a couple years ago, and now we're digging at Shiloh. So um, before I share, get into about Shiloh, we're going to go to our second slide, if we will, up on the screen. I just want to share a couple verses from Scripture, because sometimes there's a question of, you know, is this just an intellectual thing that we're doing as it relates to archaeology and the Bible? What is the, what is the scriptural foundation for what our ministry is, is called to do. And this is one of the scriptures that we refer to. Probably a lot of you have heard it before. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you. Now that could be any kind of question, any kind of reason for the, for the hope you may have within you, but it may relate to how can I trust the Bible? How do I know that it's true? How do I know these events occurred in the past that are recorded in the Scripture? So that's one aspect of our ministry is the apologetic, the defense of the faith. As Jude says, the, uh, earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to all the saints, right? And then in our next slide here, 2 Corinthians 10.5 a little bit stronger language from Paul, Peter admonishes us to be very careful in our posture as we engage with someone who does not know our Lord and Savior, right? We, we certainly don't want to lord over anyone or be judgmental of anyone. Do it with gentleness and respect, right? That's the, the command that Peter gives us. But here's another dimension of apologetics. This language is stronger. Now, I just want to point out, it's not directed against the person, but against the argument that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. And Paul uses this pretty strong language. We demolish arguments. We destroy arguments. That's pretty powerful language for Paul to use. But again, it's directed at falsehood that comes against the church or rises up within the church itself. And that our responsibility, particularly leaders in the church, but all of us at some level are responsible to recognize falsehood and to show why it's not true. So to show why an argument is not true. And and as you saw in the video, you heard my colleague Dr. Wood, our director of research, talk about that the critics are wrong when they say that certain events in the Bible didn't happen. What we're saying is those arguments that they make are incorrect. And not only, not just because we believe the word of God and God has spoken, although that's the foundation, is that there's actually evidence that shows why their arguments don't hold up to scrutiny. And that's part of the calling that God has put on our ministry to help show uh, with good research and argumentation why the Scriptures can be trusted. So on our next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about our dig now at biblical Shiloh. And when you think about Shiloh, in this uh, next slide here, number four, you think about, typically the first thing you think about is the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle is the dwelling place of God in the Old Testament. It travels with the Israelites in the wilderness, right? And when they come into the land, they settle into the land. There's a variety of events that occur. We'll we'll go over that in a minute. And the, the center of Israelite worship is centered at Shiloh before the temple is built. Okay, so this is of great significance. This is the place where people come at this point because Jesus hasn't come into the world yet. This is where people must go to commune with God. And through the sacrificial system, 
they are reconciled to God, at least temporarily. Okay, that's all part of the Old Testament corpus given to us. Um, it, is, it is the Word of God as far as it goes, but it's not enough. And that's why Jesus is the promised one given in the Old Testament to come and fulfill all the promises that were given in the past, all the promises given through the Old Testament text, and to fulfill the sacrifices, as we see in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus once and for all satisfied the sacrifices that God demanded for sin, the terrible, egregious, eternal punishment that we deserve for our sins. But at Shiloh, this is the period of time where the Israelites, this is where they go to worship. So we're going to go on just a little bit of a journey this morning, just to give you a little bit of background. Now, there's two things related to Shiloh here we're going to show on our next slide. I'm going to show you a map. And then we're going to talk about chronology. Now, these are the two of the most boring subjects for people, geography and chronology. But I would submit to you that they're both very important. Geography is important, as you know, if you're driving in the car with your wife and your GPS isn't working and us men refuse to stop somewhere and ask for directions. Suddenly, geography is very important. And chronology is even more important because you know what happens if you forget your anniversary. Right? Time is important not only in the here and now and geography, but it's important to God in the Bible. And you, the Old Testament is filled with geography and chronology. It's really, it's really interesting to see. Our next slide here, we're going to take a look at two uh, places. The bottom arrow is pointing to Jerusalem. So if you're not into geography and you're looking for Jerusalem on your map, find the Dead Sea, the top of the Dead Sea, go left. There's Jerusalem. And dead north of Jerusalem, about 18 to 20 miles, is the city of Shiloh, okay? So this is where our excavations are taking place in Israel, and this is where uh, the tabernacle was located for approximately 300 years. So this is where the Israelites worshipped for a long period of time uh, during the Old Testament period. This goes from the early Judges period all the way down to the time of Samuel, and to the time of David, of course, until Solomon when the temple is built in Jerusalem and then the worship is transferred there. So we go to slide seven. Now, if we take a look, uh, we just think about the background here. The Israelites come into the land, right? They defeat the king at Jericho, at Ai. They fight a campaign against the uh, uh, a coalition of kings around Jerusalem. They have a covenant renewal ceremony. There's a whole bunch of events that occur, and they finally settle in, Joshua 18.1. The whole assembly of Israel was gathered at Shiloh. They set up the tent of meaning, meaning the tabernacle. In Hebrew, it's called the Mishkan, and the country was brought under their control. So this is a very, very important. You can see there's a model of the tabernacle there. At the time, the Israelites were going through the wilderness and wandering, and here at Shiloh in the beginning was portable. Right? It was a portable structure where they could move around with it, and they, there was very precise instructions that God gives in the Old Testament for its design and for how the worship was to take place. You read through uh, Leviticus and so on, you see all of that. So, but we feel it's likely that in time, because the tabernacle was, so, was there for so long in Shiloh, it's possible that the Israelites set up a more permanent structure. So... Our theory is, if we go to the next slide here, is it the possibility, a little bit hard to see, but uh, there's a couple of theories that have been uh, out there about, well, where was the tabernacle at Shiloh? You can see here is an overhead view of Shiloh, and there's a couple of theories. It was in the north, the top of your map. It was at the south. It was on the, uh, the hill, the top, the, the high place of Shiloh. Where was the tabernacle? And uh, the theory that we've developed is the possibility that perhaps it was portable. Maybe they moved it around a little bit, and then finally it settled into a more permanent structure. In fact, it, uh, the text of Scripture says that there were doors on the tabernacle later on, perhaps indicating a more permanent structure. Now, I'm going to show you, just teach you a little bit about archaeology and what's done. Uh, nothing technical, but to uh, just talk about it a little bit, what we do in the field, and then we're going to talk about, well, what could you find in the world of archaeology related to either the tabernacle or Shiloh that fits the Bible? And so hopefully you'll find that 
very interesting. So first here on our next slide, we have the area that we're digging in. This is the northern section of Shiloh. You can see in the pink area is where our team has been digging. We've been there for two seasons. Uh, we go for four weeks. I only go for two um, myself, but our team goes for four weeks to Israel to dig, and we have volunteers from all around the world who participate in that. So there's the area that we, we dig in. Our next slide, please. And we set up our site in a grid. So it's five by five meter squares. And we scientifically photograph and measure and keep track of everything that we find. When you dig in archeology, span you don't dig holes. You dig and you, you go down like draining a bathtub. So you go even all across the five by five meters and you go down, just like a bathtub. And the idea is to record everything that you find as you're going down. It's a meticulous process. Uh, but it's very important because once you destroy it, it's destroyed. Once you dig it up, you can't restore it. So it's important that we are very careful in the way that we record it and that we follow all the protocols that are involved with it. So let me share with you some cool discoveries that have been found at Shiloh and some things that we've found that are related to the history of the Bible and the history of the site. A few years ago, our next slide, please, an altar was found. Well, we'll skip over this one and uh, go to this one here. Now, you can see um, on the top right-hand side, there's an altar. And this is, this is the, the kind of altar that was used in the Old Testament sacrificial system. So the Israelites were instructed by God how he wanted the altar built and then how the sacrifices were to take place. And at Shiloh, uh, an altar was found in 2013. It was being used from a later period. Somebody used it as a part of a wall or something. And it's clear that it was an altar. So here we have at the place where God's people communed and did sacrifices, the Israelites, remnants of an altar. And it fits the biblical account and, it, and, and the way that it's shaped uh, fits very nicely with the way that the altars were supposed to be built by the Israelites. So again, here's just one artifact that's found in the world of archaeology. Now, I should point out here, this doesn't prove the Bible in the sense of, you know, it's the Word of God by having an altar. But what it does do is it just it takes a little piece of data and it points to the Scriptures. It says, we have altars, they're built this way, the Israelites were supposed to build them this way, and lo and behold, what do we find in archeology? span We find an altar that's very similar to the descriptions found in the Old Testament text. And so when this data begins to accumulate, you can start really making a case about the accuracy of the scriptures. And that's where the power of the evidence is, is in the totality of it as it adds up over a period of time. So here's an altar, right? And our next, slide, we have evidence of, here's a piece of jewelry that we found. Now, this isn't necessarily biblical in the sense, but it shows that the site was occupied probably around this time of, of um, uh, leading up to the time of David. This bead is a piece of jewelry. It's 3,000 years old. It's quite extraordinary. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that you discover in archaeology that's really exciting because somebody wore this somebody who lived a long time ago, somebody who lived at the very place where God's people gathered to worship him. And we can see on our next slide multiple pictures of it. It almost looks like an eye or something like that. Now, how did we find this little bead? That's a question that people often ask. This little teeny tiny thing, how did you find that in the dirt? Well, we do some cool stuff, uh, some meticulous work to, to make sure we don't lose this kind of thing. In our next slide, we'll see what we do, the first thing we do after we dig, and by eyeball, we look, we're trying to see everything we can, we sift the material. And you can see my friend Steve here from Canada. Steve is what we're doing, what we call dry sifting. All right, so we sift through every single bucket of dirt that we dig up. And you can imagine, that's a lot of work. And that's why we had over 140 volunteers this past year come and participate in our excavation, the biggest dig in Israel. We praise God for that, uh, that our small ministry, that God has raised up so many people to come and to serve who are willing to be part of what we're doing. Um, most digs are funded by large 
universities and so on, but we're a nonprofit Christian ministry. But the Lord has blessed us beyond measure and moved in the hearts of God's people to come and to do this work. So we depend on God's people. Otherwise, we could not carry out what God has called us to do. And so here's Steve. Steve has been faithful. He's been on our digs many, many years uh, going through. So we go through and we look for artifacts or anything that looks like it might be something, and then it's analyzed. But then there's another step. We wet sift it then. And this is a unique technology that we are the only dig in Israel outside of Jerusalem that does this. We build a station where we use water to then sift through the dirt that, that Steve was sifting through that doesn't fall through to find more artifacts. And this is sifted through water. And we found that bead in our wet sifting process. And if we didn't have it, if we didn't have the funds that the God's people have donated and the, the workers to do that, we would have never found it. So, so there's a meticulous scientific process that takes place. And often you're, you know, you, you, people think that faith and science are two separate realms. And that's, not, that's just not true. Um, we can glorify God by doing the work in archaeology with excellence. But also, we believe the Scriptures. And both are compatible with one another. And that's what we're striving to do in our, in our dig at Shiloh. So you get an idea of just what volunteers do and what we do in our work to discover these artifacts. Now, our next slide, you'll see a really cool artifact. This is from Egypt. Now, Egypt had a long-term relationship with Canaan before the Israelites came into the land. And when the Israelites settled in, in Israel, when, you're very, when you read the text very carefully, you'll see that they took over the central hill country but it took them many years to eventually expel the Canaanites from the land. It was a very long process, and they really didn't bring it fully under their control until the time of David. Uh, so Egypt had an ongoing relationship with elements of the Canaanite population, and they would bring soldiers in and out and so forth, and there was a trade route that went through the, the coast of Israel. But the point of this is, is that these Egyptian scarabs, now this is a good luck charm, from Egypt. Uh, this shows that there's a relationship still between Egypt and people in the land, and it shows that the site was occupied. Now, these scarabs often have the names of pharaohs on them. So we can date them because we know the dates that the pharaohs reigned in Egypt. It's really fascinating. And we have found about five of them now in two seasons digging at Shiloh. This one is from 1600 BC. So this is 3,600-year-old scarab, and then the next slide here is another scarab that we discovered around from the same time period. So we'll study these, and then we'll, we'll publish about them and, and share pe with people more about why they're important and so on. But, but these are the kind of discoveries that get people really excited because they find something like this that's 3,600 years old that came from Egypt. Another discovery that makes sense when you think about it on our next slide here the sacrificial system at Shiloh was there for 300 years. You can imagine the number of animals that were killed in the sacrifices and the amount of bone material that would be found at a site like Shiloh. Uh, I'm sure they disposed of it, but we have found in, in the squares that we work in bags and bags and bags filled with bones. More bones than I've ever seen. Our previous site, we didn't hardly have any bones. This, to me, is, is a remnant of evidence of the sacrificial system at Shiloh during the Israelite period and occupation there. And here we have a tool, for example. It looks like somebody took a bone and just made it into some kind of tool for some purpose. But we have found thousands of bones already just in two years. And what we do is we collect them, and then we send them off to an expert in Israel who's an expert on bones to tell us what kind of animals they are. What's interesting is so far... Uh, the profile of the animals is there's no pigs at all. And this is indicative of what the Israelites, the Israelites were not supposed to have any involvement with pigs, right? Remember in the Old Testament law. So we're finding some evidence that's consistent, at least it seems like the Israelites 
obeyed the Lord, at least in this instance, of the kind of animals that they were sacrificing there. And then we have another picture here. It looks like a, we call it a bone spatula. Um, but this is just an example of some of the things that, you, that we have found. Again, bone, it fits the Bible. It doesn't prove the Bible, but it fits. It's a piece of evidence that all comes together. And as the years go by, we'll accumulate this evidence as it relates to the bones. We found a, um, a bone dump at our site as well, which we're gonna reanalyze in future excavations. Now, one of the uh, most exciting things that people love to find is pottery, because pottery, pottery is, is what we use to look into the ancient world, how people stored their food, how they cooked it, um, olive oil, wheat, all that kind of thing. Pottery was part of everyday life in the ancient world. And if you think about, maybe if you went to your grandmother's or your great-grandmother's house, and she had her old dishes from 50 years ago, you would look at it and you go, oh, those are from, those are not modern dishes, those are from the 1950s or 60s or something like that. You would recognize that, you would know. Plates and cups, they change over time, right? Cars would be another example. You know, you see pictures of Cuba and you see people driving around in a 57 Chevy, you know that the cars are from a different era. Well, it's the same thing with pottery. It changed over time. And so we know from all the pottery that's been discovered how to date it and how to show when the site was occupied and uh, an idea of how they made their pottery and so on. So here's a, a storage jar, for example. This is from the Iron Age period. This is the Judges period. So this storage jar is 3,000 years old. And we're our next slide here, I think we have another picture here. Here's a whole bunch of them that have been uncovered, just sort of left abandoned. We're not exactly sure why they were just sort of left there, but they left covered over in time for us in the providence of God to discover, showing that the site was occupied during the time that the Bible indeed says that it was occupied. Fascinating and exciting for us. Here's the next, next slide. Here's an oil lamp. You know, your word is a light unto my, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is the kind of artifact that is in the mind of the psalmist when he's writing this. You can see the point at the end. There's a little wick that goes in there and then the open section is where the oil was poured and they would light the wick and they would hold it in their hand or put it on a shelf inside of their house and it would light up a section of the room or light, maybe perhaps they were outside at night, and so on. So this is really cool because this gives you an idea of, well, what does a lamp look like when you read that, the text? Here, you see what an ancient lamp, this is from the king's period, from the period of the kings. So this is about 27, 28, 2900 years old, somewhere in that range. This is what an oil lamp looked like. And so this is an illustration, again, of what we find in the biblical text uh, this related to the psalmist, since lamps are mentioned throughout the scriptures in various places. The guy who found this was so excited, he took a video of it, and he put it on Facebook, and he was just beside himself because it was so cool that he was holding something from so long ago that we find recorded in the Bible, lamps, oil lamps, uh, from the scriptures. Now, here's a picture of my team. Here's a wall that we found. Uh, you can see at the lowest point, the lady in red over there in the right uh, is quite tall. She's about five foot three or so. You can see how much taller this, this wall is than her. Uh, it was about four and a half meters tall, made of these large stones, and it's on the outside of the city. And we've identified this wall from the time of the Canaanites, right? So this wall is about 3,500, 3,600 years old based on the pottery and so on. So this was after two weeks of digging. We got down to the bottom, we got down to bedrock, and so we got to take this great picture. And uh, we were so happy that we made it because the boss kept saying, I wanna see the whole wall and I wanna see it before you leave. So we worked really hard to expose this wall here. Now, this wall is from the period of the Canaanites. This is before the Israelites came into the land. So let's talk a little bit about this because we're going to talk about different walls related to this. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
and this overhead, you can see now, uh, this is an overhead shot of the fortifications around the city of Shiloh. You can see that thick section of wall there. That's about five meters wide, okay? So we're talking about 15 feet wide. This is how the Canaanites built their cities. Shiloh was built by the Canaanites before the Israelites came into the land. So the question is, you're probably wondering, well, why is that important? Why is, it, why is the size of the wall important? Why is the wall important? Does the Bible talk about walls? Well, in fact, it talks very much about the walls, and it talks about walls that are in Canaan before the Israelites enter the land. Let's go to the next slide. Here's a little bit of chronology for you. The Israelites come into the land around 1400 B.C. That's 1400 years before Jesus, right? The Exodus is around 1446, based on the text of Scripture. And then we have the sojourn, which is 430 years. Remember, the Israelites were in Egypt 430 years. So the Canaanites are living in the land during this period of time. And you'll recall from the biblical account in Numbers 13, and Moses recollects this in Deuteronomy, in our next slide, please, he sends the spies into the land. You know the story, right? The spies go into the land, uh, they go in for a while, they come back, and they report various things about the land. There's giants in the land, and uh, we're like grasshoppers to them, a very faithless kind of report, right? And the, as the events unfold, it becomes quite dreadful. Uh, the people get all stirred up, and they're ready to kill Moses because they're afraid to go into the land now, Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that say, no, 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 no. God is, God is faithful. He, he can defeat the Canaanites. Let's believe Yahweh. He's, he's taken us this far. He's worthy of our trust. But the situation has degenerated very badly. But they say something that actually ends up to being true. And the reason it's true, but they're using it to dissuade the Israelites to go into the land. And they say, the cities are great and walled up to heaven, fortified up to heaven. This is kind of a strange sort of expression. It's sort of hyperbole. But the point of it is the cities are big and the walls are huge. And there's no way that we can take the city. We can't go into the land. We just can't do it. And God can't do it is effectively what they're saying. Well, we find all over Israel in the archaeological record, what do you know? Canaanite walls, gigantic walls, just like the one at Shiloh that you saw there, just the bottom of it, just the remnant of it. But in this next picture, let me show you this massive wall that was discovered at Shechem about 50 years ago. Now, Shechem is from Joshua 9, where the Israelites have their covenant renewal ceremony. This is a Canaanite wall from the time period that the spies went into the land. So when the spies say the cities are great and walled up to heaven, that's exactly what we find in the archaeological record. This is an eyewitness testimony to the truthfulness of what the scriptures record from that time period. Now, a lot of people will say, you'll see on TV, often, you know, these stories in the Bible, they were written hundreds of years after the events that are described. They were written during the Babylonian exile, and they were written during the, after the exile, and so on. That just simply does not hold up to the evidence. The evidence is that this is an eyewitness account. There's no way that someone living hundreds of years later could have known about these walls and these kinds of cities that were built in Canaan. It's a testimony to the truthfulness of God's Word. So the walls we find at Shiloh, that have been found at Jericho, at I, and here you can see this monumental structure at Shechem, testify to the truthfulness of the text of God's Word. Now, it, it seemed to me as we come down to the end, and I can't believe how quickly it's gone, when we think about this account, the value of archaeology related to the account shows you the walls. You, think, you look at that wall and you go, how, am, how could we possibly scale the walls of the city? The same kind of structures were around the city of Jericho. And yet Yahweh brought the city walls down, didn't he? He brought the walls, they came tumbling down, and the Israelites conquered the city. So 
you know, it, remi- it really reminded me of the giants that we face, the walls that we face as the church. We don't face physical structures, per se, but spiritual ones, don't we? Health, uh, difficulties at work, uh, relationships, all kinds of giants, walls that are in our life. And how often uh, do we have to check ourselves spiritually that which, which spies are we going to respond as? The spies who came back and grumbled or the spies Joshua and Caleb? And this is one of the great lessons that I get out of these kind of events from the Scriptures to draw out of them not only the facts of archaeology, but the application. How, how can this speak to me now in my walk with Jesus? I mean, these are walls from 3,500 years ago, but how does that impact how I raise my daughter? How faithful I am to following, uh, obeying God's Word, and so on. Well, I, or the obstacles in my life. It's an issue of trust and belief in what... God has said is true, and that he's able to bring down giant walls like those in our lives. The last part that I'll apply here to you is is this. You think about Joshua coming into the land. You know, Joshua's name is Jesus, Yeshua. He's a savior figure, if you will. You see this in the Old Testament with Joseph, and you see it with Joshua. Types, foreshadowings of the one who is to come. Now, what's different about Joshua and Jesus is Joshua goes in the land and he is a representative. He destroys God's enemies through war. Jesus does things a little bit differently. The first phase of his ministry is not to wage war, but to give his life as a suffering servant on our behalf. And this is the beauty, beauty of the gospel for us. Now, he will wage war on our behalf spiritually, and he will return someday as the conquering king. As Joshua went into a small tract of land, though significant, Israel, very important, right? Jesus comes not to conquer a small section of land, but to redeem all of creation on our behalf. It's a beautiful picture of what we see in the Old Testament, a picture of what is to come when Jesus comes again to restore all things to the way they were intended to be and to bring and gather a people to himself. This is one of the things that I I draw out of these accounts of the Old Testament. I want to encourage you to draw them out of them too. Look to look for Christ in the Old Testament, as Jesus said in Luke 24, You know, all the scriptures were written about me, he says, on the road to Emmaus. This is true. And we find these analogies and these types all throughout the text of scripture. I encourage you with that today as I come down to the end. I know my presentation often can be sort of informational. What do I do with all this information? You know, you're sharing all this data with me about rocks and stones and bones and scarabs and walls and all that other kind of thing. But as you can tell from our video this morning and from my talk, there's much more to this. They're integrated together. I ask for your prayers as we continue to conduct our ministry. I just want to share with you a couple of quick items as I, as I wrap up. We do have some literature and items out in the foyer. Uh, you can get a free copy of our magazine if you sign up for our newsletter. And I'll be out there after the service if you have any questions. I'm very thankful to be here. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share with you this morning about our ministry and what we do. And I ask, uh, we ask for your support in terms of of prayer. And um, I'm just really grateful to be here to share with you about what we do. And most of all, to glorify God that he's given us this glorious revelation of Scripture and that we can trust it. No matter what you do with what I've shared with you today, go away with this one thing if only one thing, you can believe what God has said in the Scriptures. You can believe it with your very eternal life. I do. As we've talked, my brother Steve and I have talked about, you know, we trust Jesus with eternal life, and all of what he's given is deposited in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. 
Thank you very much.